Our next speaker is going to be Raymond Detweiler, uh, who's going to be talking to us about lab diagnostics of Lyme disease, past, present, and future. And uh, Dr. Detweiler is a professor of microbiology, immun immunology, and medicine at the School of Medicine, New York uh, Medical College. Please join me in welcome him, w welcoming him very warmly. Um, I have to tell you about my conflicts. I have patents. I have deals with uh, uh, BioRad and Kyogen, and I own a biotech company. So some of this stuff, uh, the patents are held by that biotech company. I've been in this business a long time. Uh, I actually started doing Lyme disease in the early 1980s, and I was on the CDC panel that wrote the two-tier two guidelines. And I'm going to actually tell you some of the problems with that right now. So if you look at the history of Lyme disease diagnosis, well, it really started when they found the uh, Willie Bergdorfer and uh, Jorge Benash and uh, people found uh, the organism. And they began to culture it. And so you could make crude tests based on cultured bacteria, and you could grind it up and put it on an ELISA plate. And that was really how it started. But that test had a lot of false positives. So um, you, you began to uh, say, how can we make this better? Because the predictive value, the ability of a, of a positive test to predict someone really had it was poor. So Alan Steer's group came up with uh, what's called the Dressler criteria, which is Western Block criteria. And CDC got a bunch of labs and, together and had a contest. And, Three labs uh, determined that the um, Western block criteria actually improved things. The big problem was false positives. And we, so, so the two-tier uh, system was established in the mid-1990s. Uh, and we got the C6 later on in, at the end of the 1990s. And um, we continued to try to define the, the proteins and we call them antigens, of uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. So we're still using that criteria from the, that was developed in the 1980s and 1990s. There's a lot of problems with that. First of all, um, whole, whole bacteria, it doesn't matter what bacteria it is, they contain antibody binding sites. And a definition of an antibody binding site is an epitope. So you'll see that term throughout my lecture that are common to all bacteria. These are nonspecific. So you get a, a mouth infection, or you got an E. coli urinary tract infection. You're going to make an antibody response against whatever organism you're infected with. You can pick that up in those Lyme tests. The other thing is that cultured uh, Borrelia burgdorferi will lose a lot of the genetic material that it needs to make the proteins so those early tests that were based on cultured uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, well, a lot of them became empty bags after a while, and they, they lost their antigen, so they, they had lousy sensitivity. And the other thing that we realize now is that not all of the important proteins of Borrelia burgdorferi are expressed in culture. Some of them are only expressed in the, in the mammal whether it's you or whether it's a, a, a white-footed mouse or whatever. And that is what we didn't realize when this was put together. This does not have in vivo expressed antigens in there, and it doesn't have, and it also has cross-reactive proteins in there. So um, we didn't have good definitions of what was in those Western blots. Those are just bands on, on, a, on, a, on a gel. So when you look at it, the sensitivity of the two-tier system is re reported. It's not that great, in, it's in early disease especially. So early disease, we're looking at 30 to 40 percent, and it doesn't matter whether you see six or any of the, other, any of the others. Um, it's later in the course of the disease that these tests get better. So another thing that's very important to realize when you, when you do a Western blot, Western blot is called a 1D gel, one dimension. 
you're looking at a band. But if you look at a 2D gel, a 2D is going to pull these proteins apart. Many areas of these bands, there's more than one protein in, 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 that, 1D, in that 1D gel. And that's important because if you look at, 30, just for instance, 31, and some labs say 31 specific. So you got a 31 band, you have Lyme disease. Well, there's a big problem because that other protein in there is a, which is expressed in Burley burgdorferi, is expressed in all gram-negative bacteria. So you have a urinary tract infection or a, uh, uh, with E. coli or something like that, you can have that band and it will pick, and a, a Lyme Western blot will pick it up. It's not specific. And uh, this gives you a, 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 an idea of the complexity, which was not addressed in, that, in those CDC things. So if you look at what's on there, the blue uh, uh, are the, an, an, I mean, the antigens associated with uh, the uh, Western blot, you'll notice some of them I've starred. Each one of the ones I've starred is highly cross-reactive and a protein that cross-reacts with a lot of other bacteria. Totally, so it, it decreases the specificity of, of this assay. And uh, cross-reactivity, uh, if, if, this is some examples. Greater than 40% of individuals will, with uh, no history of Lyme or from places like the desert southwest in the United States will have a positive 41 band. Why? The answer is, is because fl all flagella, all uh, bacteria with flagellums, that's a little tail that wiggles them around and makes them move, cross-react. The 60 KD band, greater than 16% of normal people will have a positive. That one I pointed out, uh, that's BBO323, uh, is, is also cross-reactive. So what we have is we have a real problem when we use cultured whole uh, substrates like this for uh, either Western blots or first tier assays. And this is an example of, of, um, of flagellin. If you look at the uh, protein, there are parts of it which are highly cross-reactive with all other bacterial flagellins, but there's parts that are specific to uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. And you can use that as a tool, and that's what, one of the things that we did, to try to define how can we make things better. Uh, if we look at P66, which is one of the bands on, a, on, on, a, on the Western blot, and this is complicated. We looked at all the different uh, epitopes of it, and they, they have epitopes which are uh, cross-reactive with people with no healthy normals, uh, with other diseases, and uh, it, it's a problem. Um, we, I'll skip this one. Uh, so what can we do? And the answer is we could look at the, the proteins that of the bacteria that causes Lyme and define what are the antibody binding sites that make it nonspecific and get rid of them and just use the areas where the, those epitopes are pretty unique to uh, Burrell or Bigdorfe. In doing that, we conceptually can improve both sensitivity and specificity. Now, the first assay that actually did that was the C6 assay. C6 assay is, a, is an epitope or an an, uh, of VLSE, which is a big outer surface protein that's only expressed in vivo. And it is, um, yeah, it's pretty good. It's probably, the, it's probably the best single test out there, although it's not perfect. One of the things, it doesn't bind to IgM very well, and it's not express VLSE, the parent protein, is not expressed until after the establishment of infection. It's not, a, so the, the human immune system doesn't see it straight away. It takes a while to see it and uh, people like that. 
um, that's too complicated, that's too complicated. And, and I, I'm doing this, I'm skipping slides because I, I want to keep in the time limit. So what we can do is we can use peptides containing epitopes that are specific for uh, Borrelia and try to make a better assay. And in fact, we, we've done that. And um, right now, they're in trials. Uh, BioRad, which is a big pharmaceutical company that makes a lot of tests, is, is putting together a study so they can take it to the FDA and try to do it. So what are, what, no matter how good we make serologies, there's certain problems. It takes time to make an antibody response. So you don't make, you get bit by a tick, I, I draw your blood, you're not gonna have antibodies. So you have, first you make IgM, and that takes a week before you start getting a lot to measure. And then you make IgG, and that takes another week. The other thing, too, is that once you make an immune response, especially for IgG, you have a mature immune response, you can keep that forever. So antibody levels do not correlate with treatment outcomes. You could be seropositive for the rest of your life, and it doesn't mean you're still infected. It just means you, what? If you had mumps when you were five, I draw your blood, you have anti-mumps antibodies. You don't have mumps, you had it. So that, that's an important thing. And another aside, after treatment, your tendency is, in many people, for those antibodies to fall away, but it's not predictive of anything. So some it does, some it doesn't. That's why when you look at uh, those studies from those package inserts, those were all treated patients. So and most of them were erythema migrans, and they're fine, and it's not, a good, it's not very predictive of anything. So what, is, what else is out there? So I, I can say we, we've got a better serology coming. It's more sensitive in early disease. It's, it's more specific, but it's still not the end. Metabolomics. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi changes how your body utilizes certain things. And that's a possibility. Uh, transcriptome analysis, that's, you know, your, um, your immune system responds to anything. Is there a unique markers in, the, in your responses that can do it? That's something. And these are really early stage. The other thing which I'm involved in is monitoring T cell activity. We have when you make an immune response, you make antibody, that's B cells, but you also make a T cell response. And that's commonly used in T, uh, in TB, and, uh, and things. So what are the advantages of T cell responses? And this is more primitive work. Well, you get an early response. You can measure it faster than you can make an antibody response. And T cell responses wane with successful, uh, successful treatment. So the number of T cells uh, are, are, that are responding uh, is dependent upon the presence or absence of infection. So that may be, uh, and, and you, we know after a successful outcome, the number of T activated T cells contract. And we, we can measure these uh, substances called cytokines, which, which are proteins or substances that are released by uh, immune cells, and that's how they communicate, and you can measure them. So we, uh, <clears throat> this is something we just published, and it's based on what's called quantifuron technology, and quant quantifuron is a TB test, and you measure the amount of gamma interferon, which is a cytokine produced by activated T cells in response to a, uh, an, an, an antigen. And like the B cell stuff, we don't use whole proteins. We use peptides. We mapped the, the, the T cell recognition sites on these proteins, too. So, uh, and that takes a while. And this is an example of how you do a cytokine release assay. You just take some whole blood from a patient, incubate it for uh, overnight, spin it down, and measure the amount of gamma interferon or other cytokine. We're working on other cytokines, too. And you can then begin to get a picture of the immune response. And <clears throat> these are some of the target peptides from these target antigens that we used. And we specifically, again, screen out highly cross-reactive uh, uh, 
uh, T cell uh, epitopes. And <clears throat> this is a preliminary study which was recently published in which we took <clears throat> 29 patients, all with erythema migrans, and so these very early patients, and what we saw was that um, a fairly typical picture, uh, 23 uh, have, had single erythema migrans, six had multiple erythema migrans, the, the usual uh, things that you would expect to see in someone with an acute effect, infection. And unfortunately, none of this is specific for, 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 for Lyme, except for the erythema migrans. And then when we looked at the gamma interferon, what we found is that 69% of them were positive in this assay. That's, that's much better than, than the serologic assays. At <clears throat> convalescent, we didn't get everybody back, but what we found is after two months, we had a marked decrease in the uh, uh, number of positives in that population, and everybody was treated and did well. In this. So all of these 29 patients were promptly treated, and they're all well, uh, and they were well at their the two-month and six-month follow-ups. Um, so that is something that we're optimistic about. And we look at, we ran C6 and Western blots on the same patient population, and it's clearly better than the, um, than the C6, and it's really much better than, than the, uh, the Western blot. The Western blot um, is something that was put in place again to help get rid of all the false positives that you have with whole Borrelia assays. And that is something that's a, that's a problem, that it was recognized at the time. But I can say one should not do Western blots just by themselves because, they, because Western blots have their own problems. Everything has its own problems. And what we need, I think, is more of basic science research, more support to get things better. But as a scientist, and that's what I consider myself, I can tell you that I am trying to make things better, as are lots of other people. And the, the amount of progress that's been made from the 1980s to now is dramatic. And it's only with funding of research that it's going to get even even better. Now, you'll know I haven't talked about late Lyme disease. It's as uh, Brian Fallon pointed out. It's hard to get those patients because you need to do these studies. You need extremely well characterized patients uh, because it's too easy to make mistakes. And you, when you're dealing with patient populations, you don't want to make mistakes. We 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 do we, the with the best intentions, uh, and in the 1980s and 90s, we were doing the best we can. But, but it's time, I think, that we start to move on from that 1980s, 1990s technology and to you know, modern technology. But the only way you're doing it is not just, I think I, this is a good idea. You gotta understand how the immune system works and in, in, in interacts with this infection. You gotta understand the bacteria, and you've gotta, but that takes money. And for a while, the NIH at, in the States, they were, uh, four years ago, they were only funding 8% of the grants. So the politicians out here have to realize you gotta spend some money. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> yeah.